Mara D for Mrs. Shot of Ocali, and I've been asked by Una Matthewson there in the Centre Library, Letter Kenny, to give a short talk or presentation on the War of Independence in Kahanili. Uh, and here goes, so I'll try sharing with you uh, a PowerPoint um, on uh, the War of Independence in Kahanili. <laughs> So that's the voice of Johnny McGeever, who was a volunteer during the War of Independence from Derek Connor here. I had the privilege of recording him. He was 99 at that time and uh, he had lots of memories of his involvement as a volunteer and he died shortly after that uh, recording. So that's Johnny McGeever. Um, and just to begin, the local situation very much reflected the national situation. Uh, and it's important, I think, to give that background that, you know, Patrick Pierce had pointed out that every generation for the last 300 years, six times during the last 300 years, that they'd asserted themselves in arms uh, and that there was nothing new that 1916 was going to happen and it was going to happen again had they not succeeded. And obviously that did happen with the War of Independence. And as we know, in 1914, home rule was promised, but then World War I broke out. And then with 1916, the whole question of our own, uh, the idea of republicanism and self-determination and more than just home rule became a, a, a debate or a, a point of political division here in Ireland. And Yeats correctly summarised this in his lovely lines, uh, all changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. And the terrible beauty being that the Irish people were going to move towards a republic and that that would have to happen. And much of what happened after 1916, that there were 190 men and women were tried, 90 were condemned to death by firing squad, but that was down to then eventually the reduced that number to 15 and later on Roger Casement would have been the 16th because of his involvement with the odd and the importation of guns to Roger Casement. But as part of 1916, over 1,800 men were sent to internment prisons. Um, and in a way that was basically the beginning of the War of Independence because these uh, internment camps became universities of the revolution. And if you look here, there's Michael Collins. I think this is Joe Sweeney here in Donegal. These people, these men were organize themselves so when they would go come out from uh, the internment prisons that they would give hell to the British here in Ireland and that they had their networks and their cells created. And de Valera being very wise as well realised that he had new heroes, he had new um, uh, motto, he had a new flag, he had new songs, he had a new political party in a sense that he had transformed Sinn Féin from when it was Arthur Griffin's time. And then also the conscription crisis led to a hardening of views and people moving more towards uh, uh, Sinn Féin. And the very fact that Sinn Féin, so to speak, uh, were to be seen alongside the Catholic Church, where well, conscription in Ireland became law, but it was never actually enforced. And there was great national protest. And we'll see that when we come to Clonay, that that was also in, in the local areas. So Sinn Féin became very much more palpable to the Catholic population. Now here they were working with the Catholic Church and trying to stop conscription. And as we know, Sinn Féin won the general election of 1918, had 73 uh, vote seats, uh, MPs, as opposed to the Irish parliamentary only having six. And right away, Henry Wilson, Sir Henry Wilson, realised what this meant. And he said, we're sitting on top of a mine which may go up at any time. Ireland tonight has telegraphed for more tanks and guns and are evidently anxious about the state of the country. And he was right to say that because throughout the whole length and breadth of Ireland, the revolution was in the air. And really it began with the, the first dial on the 21st of January 1919. There were only 27 TDs uh, or MPs uh, uh, there at the time, Chakadala, because they were in jail. Fee Glass, Ignagala as a role. Call, uh, called out to all the other men, they weren't there, Fee Glass, Ignagalov. But on the same 
uh, setting of that diet, this, the issued a decree saying to make this declaration effective by every means at our command, the idea of ratifying the Irish Republic. And on the very same day, as we know, so that a beg had happened, Sha uh, Shan Tracy Dan Breen and Seamus Robinson had shot dead, had murdered two RIC officers. Uh, and that was the beginning of marking the War of Independence. And uh, the local um, understanding would have been reflecting that what would happen nationally, and it happened nationally as well, and to use legitimate means of warfare against the English usurper. That became very much the view. And de Valera moved to the same kind of resolution that all members of the police force acting in this country as part of the British occupation and as agents of the British be ostracised publicly and socially, and that more or less that their lives were in danger. And again, that would trickle down locally. And so very quickly, um, police uh, stations were being attacked and uh, RIC officers were being, were being shot and killed. And by the end of 1919, the first year of the War of Independence, 18 RIC officers were dead and over 100 police stations had been attacked. But it was really in 1920, as we'll see locally as well, that matters took a turn for the worse. Now it's important to understand that during this time the RIC, the Royal Irish Constabulary, were depleted. Apart from the fact that it was a 4% decline in those going in, there were some 7,000 resignations. Uh, Irish men were not going to be fighting against fellow Irish men. And so that created a vacuum and we, as we know in history, the black and tans and auxiliaries were brought in. And what people maybe don't realise that many of these black and tans and auxiliaries were Catholic, 19%, 19% of them in fact, by some historians, that's what they have recorded, and many were Irish born. And so by 1921, almost 14,000 of the new recruits that were added on to the old RIC, the 10,000, had been, so to speak, parachuted or catapulted in and amalgamated to the RIC. Um, and so Sir Hammer Greenwood, the Chief Secretary, said, well, we're only putting these, this force, Black and Tans and Auxiliaries, into the most disturbed areas, and they're nothing but the highest uh, conduct and characteristic of them. As we know, that, that wasn't the case. And Lloyd George, the, the Prime Minister, said, we have taken steps by which we have murdered by the throat, that he and, and their Black and Tans and their Auxiliaries were going to be able to quell this revolution, this war of independence that happened in Ireland. And as we know, that didn't happen. And so by the 7th of July, 1921, three years of war, um, that they had to come to an agreement with the IRA for a truce. And so by Monday, this July 11th, 1921, the truce had taken place. And thus was the end of the War of Independence. About 1,400 killed, very high numbers, 550 IRA volunteers, some of those were official executions, uh, 261 the British Army, 363 RIC policemen and about 200 civilians. And interestingly, one of the IRA volunteers that were ex was executed was Kevin Barry, uh, who was a medical student at the Royal College of Surgeons, was in class along with Dr Jack Sweeney, from Fulcara the Coroner Bar, I remember Dr. Sweeney, Dr. Jack Sweeney, um, both he and Kevin Barry were in the same class. So that's the national scene, and what I'm trying to show you now that this will be reflected very much the same process will happen locally. And so in November 1914, with World War One, the majority of the people of Clonie, like in most places in Ireland, were happy enough with home rule and were happy to go with Redmond um, and join the, the, the war effort. Remember, between 25 and 30 percent of the manhood of Ireland that were eligible to fight in World War One did fight in World War One, and there was no conscription. This was volunteers that were willing to fight. And so, when Sean McDermott and Ernest Bright arrived to Clonmel in 1914, they went to see Dan Kelly and the station, the station master, and got a hark Andy O'Dewey to try to revive uh, the Sinn Féin element of the the, the volunteers. Um, and when Hermit Pym then arrived in 1915, he didn't get a hearing and got a hard call. In fact, no one came forward. They were happy with the Allies. They were happy being part of the war. They were happy with getting home rule, it would appear. And what needs to be understood was at that time, about 30 men, I've recorded, 30 plus men died from Clonely in World War I. Uh, and obviously the number was much higher than those that had partaken or were soldiers or serving within the army during World War One. So locally, 
people were happy enough with home rule and happy with the way things were at that time. But then with 1916, that change came around. Um, people began to think differently. And Dan Kelly, who was a station master in Goddard and other men from Creaslam mobilised uh, in 1916. But that was very, very limited, the mobilisation. And so Dan then was later arrested for his... Um, activities, his, his volunteer activities, in fact he had guns and arms, and that the RIC um, and the district inspector invaded, or not invaded, they searched his house at 5am uh, one mor in the morning on the Saturday, Saturday of Easter week, they had a three day old baby in the house at the time, searching for, for arms, and Father Murray, the local curate, had heard of this, and he went up to the station where the police were, and he walked in and he chatted to them and told them, look, get some parcels ready. I'll be back later on. And by the way, I'll take the parcels with me. And they wrapped up guns and ammunition. And he went up, took the four parcels with them out the front door in, in the view of the, the police. But they dare not stop him. But Dan, anyway, was subsequently um, interned in Farngoch, uh, along with Sean Kelly and many others. Uh, Michael Collins and so forth and he would come back and play a big big part in the War of Independence here in Clonmel and that's Dan Kelly there at the station master in Goddard. Now at this time uh, at the anniversary of Roger Casement's uh, execution and anniversary mass was held in Goddard. So again, we're beginning to see a little bit of a change in the attitude and the view towards 1916 and towards the ideology of 1916. And that became more evident by July 1917 with the election of de Valera in the by-election, the Clare, uh, East Clare by-election, um, because parades took place in Fulcara and elsewhere throughout uh, the, the county. Uh, and again, when Joe Sweeney was elected for the Shin, as a candidate for Sinn Féin, there were bonfires and tar bars blazed throughout the constituency and got a hark for Cara, Crista, Anagri, and Dunfanny and elsewhere. So we see a total change by the time the uh, general election of 19 takes place. In the meantime, what helped to bring that change to a big degree was the conscription crisis that I already mentioned at the national scene. Um, and locally, people began to work together to protest against this. And it was Ethna Coyle mentions it in her diary, we'll talk about Ethna in a while, our branch took part in an anti-conscription campaign, holding protest meetings and getting the people to sign their names to the documents of protest. So they were beginning to protest locally here, didn't want uh, conscription. And when de Valera arrived here in February 1918, he came into the West of the Miguel for a visit, there was a, a torchlight procession uh, um, going through Godahar. So the welcome for him, um, was evident and the change of mind and heart was beginning to become very, very clear. However, Ernie O'Malley, funny enough, was very critical of Donegal and particularly in this area when he said Donegal was not good, the material was there, but they had no leaders. The Finn Valley was the best in the East. And Joe Sweeney at the time, the, the TD, was very annoyed with Ernie O'Malley and this perspective and this uh, attitude that he had because Joe Sweeney said that when Ernie, had a, Ernie O'Malley had arrived, it was during the general election campaign in which he got elected in as the Sinn Féin for Sinn Féin TD and that the volunteers were busy involved with the politics of getting him elected as opposed to any other aspect. Um, so for, for the, uh, understanding the, the, the layout of Donegal, this is the first northern and you can see how we were divided up into two brigades. And so the Donegal was the first northern uh, and there was four brigades, the north, the western, the eastern, the southern. And the western brigade, that would be our area, had Dunlow, Gidor, Clohanili and Chrysler. Uh, Frank Kearney was the officer in command and later Joe, pa Joe Sweeney was appointed in May 1921. And then here in Clohanili, Barney O'Donnell, uh, Kenny Beggs man was the officer in command here in Clohanili and then Dan Coyle was the captain. Uh, he was from Killot. And so they became more organised here when they managed to recruit volunteers and many of these volunteers were young men, young uh, teenagers and early in their 20s. And Frank O'Donnell and a man by the name of McGingas who came from Derry as well as, as well as Fergus Murphy from Dublin and another man by the name of McEvoy. They came to Clohanili to train the volunteers as did Dan Coyle and that's a picture of Dan there. Dan was from Dumatini and he was an XRIC constable. Uh, he started to train the local volunteers as did Hudi McGinley from Monroe as well and it's important to say that that people maybe sometimes are uh, very critical of the RIC and it's a lack of maybe knowing uh, the whole story, but uh, the the case in this 
for instance, Dan Coyle was an ex-RAC officer and he trained the, the IRA. So maybe without him, they mightn't have been as, a, as effective. And here's the ugly actual training up around Balcony. And you can see that the caps and the way they're dressed and standing to attention. Um, and there are some of the volunteers we're going to talk about. Dan McGee from Colhaim, Johnny McGee, for who you heard sing. Dan McGee then from Melmount. Um, that's him then later in the, in the Free State Army. Uh, here's Ethna Coyle. And then this is Barney O'Donnell. So we, we'll look at some of these. But when I recorded Johnny McGeever from Derek Honora, he told me that they would go out to the Majig Marshall as he trained or Shaw Shear, which he did a bugger, the Swiss for Croc, Free Croc, his heart and chin. Much your ogly give you on. Oh, Tashid League Marunish. Oh, my, oh, my. Haro Gunny Ogging. And he carried on to tell me that the guns that they had were actually wooden guns and that they had to do a lot of drilling and giving dispatches and so forth. And he would go out at night with documents but he had to stay off the, the roadways and, and travel through mountains and by the byways um, and he also talked about the dances that there used to be dances organized on Sunday nights so three pence on the door and this was how they would raise the money to buy bullets and things like that but as well as that there were private meetings held in houses here in, in, in Gotahark and particularly in, in Sweeney's there in Killalt uh, and there were protest meetings with the way uh, some of the, the, the men were still held in prison and internment um, as the um, post-1916. But I think it's very important to come on the man. That's the logo, come on the man. And this is a, a lovely poem, Invisible Woman by Brian Moore. The singer sings a rebel song and everybody sings along. But just one thing I never understand. Every damn rebel seems to be a man. For he sings of the bold Fenian men and the boys of the old brigade. What about the women? Who stood there too when history was made. I'm sure they did stand and oftentimes maybe we forget that uh, and uh, this is Bridie Gallagher, um, uh, Bridget Gallagher who lived on the main street in Fulcari I recorded her and, and she's gone to her hotel and rest but she told me I joined Coming the Man when I was a young girl as did your granny that was my granny J.D. Kelly down in Ballinas. She had a revolver belonged to her uncle Paddy Dugan from Artsbeg. She was in charge of it. Paddy was a prime suspect so in case his house was searched she gave it to Sheila. We had a room next door to Joe McBride's. The whole army gathered there. Hudie McGinney was in charge. A big crowd of girls including Myred McCarthy. I don't think it was Myred. Myred was the youngest. Um, I think it's a mistake she's made there, but it was one of the McCarthy girls, maybe Eva. Mary McGee from Newtown, Jenny Johnson, and the sizes of um, Myra. We were shown how to use a revolver. Aim first at the head, and if that didn't work, keep straight, and you would be sure to hit them somewhere. It was good crack. So the ladies had their part to play in um, the War of Independence, and one of her heroines was Ethna Coyle. She was the captain of Common the Man here in Fulcara. She later became president of Common the Man for a number of decades, uh, and she was very, very much involved in the War of Independence. And here she is here. Um, I mean, look at the way she is dressed and holding the rifle. There was nothing uh, shy about her and her ambitions for the freedom of Ireland. And in her diary, which does survive, I joined Common the Man in late 1917 or early 1918 in my native parish of Clohonili. We had about 20 members in our branch. There, um, there was an active company of volunteers under the command of Barney O'Donnell, who was always ready to help us by drilling our members, teaching us first aid, and encouraging us in, uh, in, uh, in every way possible. And uh, they helped, she says, we helped his company to raise funds for the purchase of arms and general equipment. Our branch took part in a nationwide anti-conscription campaign, holding meetings, distributing leaflets, painting walls, and advising the people to sign the anti-conscription sheet at the parish churches. So very much involved. And here she is standing on, I would imagine it's an abandoned barracks here, and the uh, Union Jack, her standing on the Union Jack. And this is a colour version of a, a black and white uh, photograph. But by early 1920, um, the IRA had gradually increased their activities. And we see by April 1927 of the RAC barracks had been destroyed in Donegal. And they were from Glen Column Kill, Barnesmore, Gidor, Duhuri, uh, Brina, uh, Kuldaf, and Bitramak Award. And wireless connections were cut so as messages couldn't be sent for further reinforcements, etc. etc. But as a result of the barracks has been been destroyed, it meant that the other surviving barracks were heavily concentrated with RIC and black and tans. And one of those barracks that hadn't been destroyed at this point was the Fulcara 
barracks that still stands. And Paddy Gobeil, the author, the great scholar and author that he is, in the book Ogden the Ross, and talks about, it says, it's a pity that the old barracks, as a translation, cannot speak. It was attacked more times than the other barracks in the area, and there's no doubt about that. I estimate about 10 times it was attacked, and numerous attempts were made to blow it up. But on a few occasions, uh, they, were, they were unsuccessful in even igniting the bomb. For some reason, they, they, they didn't ignite. Um, but uh, there's a number of, of, of times they, were, they, they attacked the, the, the barracks. And what would happen would be volunteers would come from Dunlo, from Creasy Dunfanny, and then from Gidor, and then join up with the Fulcara uh, volunteers, and they would attack the barracks. And then this would maybe happen three, four o'clock in the morning, and then they would leave again. And an official message from Dublin, Ca Dublin Castle on the 23rd of January 1921, for example, says, Fulcara Police Barracks was attacked at 4 a.m. yesterday by about 200 armed men who used bombs and rifles. So that was quite a considerable amount of young men that were there to attack the barracks in Fulcara. And um, this is a little here, a little portola, I've shown it here, on the side of the barracks. When the barracks was being attacked, uh, the barracks was designed in such a way that it was fortified. So there were metal, special metal sheets made that they could place in the windows with a little hole in it that they could set, set out their gun into it and fire back. Uh, sandbags were put up. Um, but this was the gable, Dunfanny side of the gable, and there was nothing there. There was no window. There was no way of them uh, repelling any attack from that side. And the, and the IRA volunteers knew this. So what they did was they cut out a hole and put it in this little... Uh, wooden structure. It's like a V from the inside, so the soldier could go in there with his Lewis gun uh, and fire out at any attack that came from that side. And it was Breen McCallion there of Carrow Cannon, who I recorded as well, who was a young boy at the time and could remember actually the gun out there and could remember hearing the gun being fired from there. Uh, and that, when the barracks had been restored in 1999, uh, Phil Ward that was re re restoring it, I had told them about this and they didn't touch it and it's still there to be seen. Anybody that's driving past the barracks or goes into the barracks, they'll see it from the inside as well. So um, two things then happened here locally, uh, which showed uh, the increase of the volunteers' activities. And that was the killing of Constable James McKenna, who was an RIC officer stationed in the barracks. He was shot dead by armed men on 9th, or 20, sorry, 9.50 on Sunday night from an empty house about 50 yards from the barracks at Fulcara County Megal. Now there's different versions of the story. Some say it was a honey trap, that he was going with this local girl, that he was brought to this house and then that he was sh shot, killed there. Others say that it was an accident that his gun had misfired. But the wake was held in the station. Um, very few people turned up to it. Um, but we, I do know that Anthony O'Doherty, who was a local national school teacher, Maybe he didn't have this. He didn't have sympathies with the RIC, but he knew them. Uh, he knew them before the War of Independence, um, and he went and he paid his respects to uh, the RIC on the loss of of James McKenna. Um, and then, some time later, on the local IRA volunteers then attacked three of the RIC officers that were on duty in at Got a Hark uh, for the the fair day there and one of them was shot in the hand. So again, the volunteers were getting a little bit braver. Um, and they also um, had burned down Maharoti Coast Guard Station uh, on the 6th of July, 1920. And the reason for that was that they feared that IRA, feared that the British Army would try to re um, to place some of their forces into any establishment that they could use. And the Coast Guard station at this stage was abandoned and they felt that this could be used for re uh, re recruits, people being brought in by the British to fortify their control of the area. And so it was decided that they would burn it to the ground. And it was George Meehan, that's Shan Meehan, who used to have the bookshop in Fulcara, Dan McGee, the McGees are still there, the Mandys, and Dan McGee, that's Danny Rue's connection from Colhae and Colhae and Kilog. They were present that night and they burned the, the Coast Guard station at the 6th of July, 1920, to the ground. That's just beside where the uh, Maroti National School is today. Um, and so as well as that, they also, um, try to stop trains coming in, derailing trains, stop trains coming in with uh, extra reinforcements. And the story goes, there's one lovely story that uh, Canon Tommy Doherty, who I remembered and how I interviewed and recorded, uh, he was later to be parish priest of Dunfanaghy, a, a great character of a man, um, and a, a great priest, a very, very fond memories of him. He talked about how his father was involved with the IRA in Letterkenny, 
um, soldiers had arrived to Letter Kenny and they were to be taken into Burton Port into Dunlow um, to reinforce what was there. And the IRA tried to stop this. And so they went to the stoker and said, look, do, don't you stoke the train. So if the train isn't stoked, then it can't move. And it can't move, they can't move either. And the stoker said, well, I, I'm willing to do that, but on one condition that I'm left home to Dunlow, back home. And they said, we'll sort that out. So they commandeered a car. And it was Canon Tommy Doherty as a young boy. He'd have been 18, probably. He would, I don't know if he was in the seminary at this stage, but uh, he was a very young, young boy, young man at the time. And he drove the Stoker home. And on his way back through Dunfanny, Canon Tommy Doherty, who was waiting for him at the top of the brow, going into Dunfanny, but the RIC. And they obviously knew what he had done, his, his errand. And they arrested him and put him in the cell where he was kept overnight. And I remember him saying years later that his first time to Dunfanny when he was mid parish priest there, but his, his many, many decades before that, his first night in Dunfanny was spent in jail, which was quite true. Um, and actually, Canon Doherty had many, many other stories uh, to do with the War of Independence, but that's, that's for another time. And so uh, on the Saturday, the 14th of August, 1920, a number of lorries with black and tans and other military per personnel were sent to Clohanili uh, and they searched, they carried out um, searches. And then the IRA then realised that the telegraph station in Fulcara um, was possibly sending out messages. So that was seized on the 17th of August, 1920 uh, and destroyed. And then some days later on the 9th of uh, um, or on the 28th of August, very early in the morning, the train uh, between Kashnagar, Letterkenny and Kashnagar was held up and stopped. And oftentimes the train was stopped, particularly on the way from Dunlow to Letterkenny to take the mail off. They would sit then under the, the bridge, the Mean Derry Bridge, and go through the mail to check what information the authorities might be, be, be getting. And there was one letter that they had come across, now this from someone I recorded, uh, from a Michael McCoggan. He was a, 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 he was a public and an ex-RIC officer. And he was uh, sending some information about the local uh, personnel that was involved in the War of Independence to the authorities. And on one occasion when the, um, the volunteers tried to attack the barracks, there was actually no RIC there. So they had nothing to attack and there was no shooting uh, and obviously they'd been alerted uh, that there was an attack on the way and the um, local IRA, were, they weren't happy with this and they smashed a few windows on some of the houses on the main street in Fulcara uh, and they were purposely chosen houses believed to be the people that had informed the RIC or the, R, um, the RIC yeah, that they were going to be attacked, that it was imminent. So uh, there's a few reports on that. But by 1920, the RIC had believed that their offensive and their reinforcements was, was, was with a great success. They'd eliminated many pockets of the IRA support outside West Donegal. Um, so things were still alive in Donegal, but they very, very much misread their success. And by October, they said a concentrated effort was made by the Crown forces to upset the running of the IRA in Clohanili. Captain Barney O'Donnell was arrested, the officer in command, Dan Coyle took over, and Dan then from Kilalt, he was officer in command, would later be arrested. So they tried to upset uh, the organisation, but that didn't succeed. And um, so what happened then after that, uh, the Black and Tans put a, a sign up in, um, in Clahanili saying, if the boycott of the police is not removed within 48 hours or any injury done to any member of the police, the Sinn Féin leaders of Karen got a heart will look out for themselves. In addition, their houses will be completely destroyed. And he, they talked about Balbriggan, how that, what happened in Balbriggan would happen to Clohanili. And the people did boycott the, the, the barracks. For example, they didn't provide them with turf. Some of the shops uh, were, were more likely not to, to serve them. Um, and so... Uh, you can imagine that things, there was a lot of uh, black and tans who weren't too happy, they weren't being treated uh, the way they thought they should be. And on the 17th of November, they went into Gotta Hork and into McFadden's Hotel, and we know of Terence McSevigny and the hunger strike. Uh, and there's a picture of him uh, in, in Gotta Hork, in McFadden's Hotel, now La Alton, and they went in and tore it down and smashed it. And they came back then in the early hours that evening, that would be the following day, the 17th, or the 18th, Thursday the 18th, and they went to the Irish College in Gotta Hork, which was the parochial hall or the co-op store, it was a co-op shop. But it was also the place where there was a Sinn Féin court. In order to crash the English legal system that was enforced in Ireland, a Sinn Féin court system was established. So people would go to the Sinn Féin court rather than go to the, the local 
uh, long established English court system. And so the uh, black and tans in the RIC would have known that, and so it was a target. And like Balbriggan, so to speak, they burned all the houses. Well, in this case, they set out to burn um, the College Jalu, Dau College Jalu, and it was burned completely. Uh, and all, all was left was the, was the shell. Um, now, I've done a few recordings of people, and, and one of the people that I recorded was Rose Doherty, or Rose uh, E. Doherty, and she married uh, Max Sivnia. And her father was Anthony Doherty, the great scholar whom I'd mentioned, uh, was a teacher in the area, and also had gone to visit the, 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 the removal and funeral of uh, Constable McKenna in the barracks. But she was in fifth class and she remembered the whole episodes, the shootings. She was actually involved in a hijack and ended up in Dunlow. Uh, she accompanied some volunteers. They um, obviously took her on the journey so as they couldn't be fired at. So she was kind of a means of protection. So she told, there's lots and lots of stories that she told me. And she was in her 90s when I recorded her. And this is one uh, poem that she wrote when she was in fifth class. You blackened hands, you cruel mans, a bold and lawless men, who fear the light come forth at night like foxes from your den, to rob and loot, to burn and shoot, such is your task in life, when the day will be when we will see revenge for ruthless things. And she talked also about how a drunk black and tan came into her house and went up the stairs and how she had told her br br brother Paddy to run across the street. Run, Paddy, run. And Paddy ran across the street. Paddy later became a priest uh, he was born on St. Patrick's Day 1919 and he was ordained a priest in St. Patrick's Day 1945, easy to remember. But uh, that was her Rose Doherty uh, and she had lots and lots of memories. The Military Service Pension Collection is online for anybody that's interested in finding more information, particularly in relation to the 1st Northern Division. And there's lots and lots of information. I haven't touched too much on it here today in this talk. But by 1922, February 1922, um, the RIC and the Tans began to leave the barracks that they had taken control of during the War of Independence that they hadn't uh, been pushed out of. Uh, and as we know, the 6th of July 1921 was the truce. So by, by February of 22, uh, they were leaving. And the Derry people on the 25th of February 1922 reports this week, nearly all the police barracks in the country of Negal passed into the control of the IRA. And here is the Ugly, the local volunteers standing to attention with their guns outside the barracks in Fulcara um, when they had taken control of it about February 1922. Um, and the, they, they waited for the new Gardaí, you know, they weren't called Gardaí then, it was called the Civic Guard to arrive. And the first two Civic Guards to arrive to Clough, I mean, to Fulcara was Pat Dillon and Terence Shields. And there's Pat Dillon in the middle here. Uh, the barracks was in such a way that it wasn't habitable uh, when he arrived himself as a young man, himself and Terence Shields, and Pat stayed with Bridget Dugan in the Ross's bar. And interestingly enough, that building also was where Joseph Mary Plunkett stayed for a number of months when he was learning Irish here and got a hark. But Pat was a, a, a Clare man, and I came here to Falcara on the 30th of September 1922, and as a birthday present, a son took him back in 1989, or 87, sorry, to Falcara. And uh, dad recorded them and took down some memories. Uh, so all those three now are on their eternal rest, which is their sleep in the, the Ferenia. And he died on, in 1990. So that's Pat Dillon, uh, the first guard. So th that's a, a summary and an overview of the War of Independence here in Clohanili. And sometimes maybe we think that we have a certain freedom here in Ireland, and certainly in the 26 counties, but there was a cost involved in that. Uh, and you know, something that's terribly important to say is that it just wasn't men that fought in the War of Independence. There were brave women as well, and particularly here, I think I've shown that. There were uh, ethnic oil and many of her common the man buddies uh, and uh, rebels were very much uh, to the fore in helping secure for us uh, success in what would become the War of Independence. And it's uh, ultimately led to us establishing a 26 county Ireland. So, Tasulam Gomanish of Saltas Shah, I hope you have enjoyed that um, and you enjoy um, learning from it. And um, please, God, in, in, in not too far, uh, maybe we'll be able to get to some of this published. I have done many, many recordings, uh, and here's just a short, short summary of 
uh, the War of Independence in Oklahoma Navy. So, Chene got a mic of Agus Wine Salt as a regation, got a meeting with a mic of. 